folks, uh, blessed to be here. I actually am supposed to be heading back overseas tomorrow, but uh, we've had a little bit of a change of plans, so I'll be here for about another 30 days. Uh, I know that many of you are not familiar with our ministry, so I want to give you a little bit of an understanding. We have been involved in the longest running civil war in Africa, the war in southern Sudan. In the last 61 years of the nation, we have 41 years of declared war, but there's almost been no time in the last 61 years that there's not been war somewhere in the South Sudan, and we're fighting on multiple fronts right now. About 20 years ago, we became the official training arm for the South Sudan Army, of training all pastors and chaplains for their military. And we are frontline combat chaplains. All of them, my men are armed, all of them go into battle. And I know that seems a little strange around folks, but you'll understand it as I get into the message here. Uh, we have a very intense Bible school. We get our guys up at five o'clock in the morning and we run them nine miles. Uh, we have eight hours of class time and then two and a half hours of study time daily. And we only feed the guys two meals a day of beans and corn maize. Uh, we give them meat about once every two weeks and vegetables occasionally. And the reason we do that, folks, isn't because we can't afford to feed them better. We can. But if we don't train them hard, they will not survive. Uh, once they graduate, they're deployed to forward operation units in the South Sudan Army, where they go into extremely heavy combat conditions there. And we want to give you a little bit of an understanding of the ministry, so we're going to show you a few photos here, uh, if you can bring those up there. This is our compound in the southern Sudan. This is the front uh, wall of it there. And... Uh, uh, these walls are actually designed to stop a 50 caliber machine gun bullet. For those of you who are not familiar with military terms, uh, a round of that power will cut a man in half. And so they're extremely strong. Next one. And this is just kind of the front gate uh, to the white, the white building you can see on the other side. There's uh, Sunday school rooms. We have over 1,200 children that come every Sunday. Next one. Uh, this is the front gate before we uh, extended the towers. Those are about 200 of our chaplains in the South Sudan Army. Next one. This is our church, uh, Calvary Chapel Cush in Nimely. Uh, the church holds 1,200 people. We have three services. The first is in English, the second is in Arabic, and the third is in Mahdi, which is a local dialect. This is just for adults. Next one. This is a completely different facility. This is in northern Uganda. It's a school that will open up in February of next year, and it will hold 700 children. will actually live on the compound, and as many as another 700 can come in and be taught. Next one. This is kind of the school, uh, dormitories to the left and uh, classrooms to the right. Next one. Kind of just a different angle as it's developed. Next one. And those are the teacher's areas right there. Next one. This is a little bit harder to explain, folks. Uh, in northern Uganda, we've had rebels come down and attack uh, uh, villages and capture families, and it's very often that they will take a wife and force her to kill her own husband. And they tell her, if you don't kill your husband, we're going to kill uh, all of your family. So a lot of wives have been forced to kill their own husbands. We have a farm called Canaan Farm. We've got about 150 families there. All of these families live there. They do a communal farming with us. And uh, all of them have had to kill someone within their family. And we build these women, these houses. Now, it doesn't look like by, uh, much by American standards, but they're used to living in mud huts. It cost us about four to $5,000 to build one of these for these ladies and it's a palace. The great thing is all of these women have gotten saved, all of them are born again, all of them have been healed, and they're doing extremely well. Next one. In the middle there is the president of Southern Sudan, Seba Kill. Uh, that's actually the house that I live in that we built on our compound. And uh, he came to our compound in February of last year, and he told the nation there's only one organization that's changing our nation, and it's far-reaching ministries. Now, folks, there's a lot of other good people over there, but I appreciate that the favor that God has given us with him. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, and the, uh, and the title of the message, folks, is called The Road to Damascus. I think as many believers, I think that we have some misunderstandings in Scripture. There's things that we get very clearly. There's things that we don't understand. For example, most of us truly understand that salvation is a free gift of God. There's nothing that we did to earn it. God, by his grace and his mercy uh, and the shed blood of Christ, uh, brought us into his kingdom and into the family and forgave us of our sin. But what a lot of believers do not understand is that the rewards of heaven are earned. And a lot of people don't really get that. You know, uh, I think it's strange to think that if we never do anything for Christ in this life, 
Why do we expect great treasure on the other side of eternity? The Bible says in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But folks, it doesn't say they're all mansions. It says there's many mansions. I've often wondered how many one-bedroom flats or two-bedroom condos are up there. And I just think it's strange to think that if we never do anything for Christ, we expect these great rewards on the other side of eternity. I think there are many believers that one of the things that we need to realize is that there's a road that many of us travel, which I would call the narrow road. But there's a road that I think that many of us are missing, and I would call it the road to Damascus. When Saul was on the road to Damascus, and he was persecuting the church, and he would have an encounter with Jesus Christ, and then he would become Paul the Apostle, it would forever change his life. He would never, ever be the same man again. He would be completely transformed by the Word of God. And folks, one of the things that's missing within the body of Christ today is we're not allowing the Lord to really transform us into the people that we're supposed to be. We're trying so often to be defined by this world than be defined by the things of the kingdom. See, as believers, we are supposed to be people that are fanatically sold out for the gospel. We're supposed to have a passion that truly supersedes all other things in our life. And I think that many people are missing that road to Damascus experience. When I was in the 10th grade, I lied about my age and joined the United States Marine Corps and uh, actually volunteered for uh, combat duty in Vietnam. I was a pretty highly trained soldier, folks. I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion. I trained at the Navy SEAL base, the Army Ranger base, and we had our own uh, a form of specialized training there. I was also a competitive shooter for the Marines. I used to travel around and shoot competition. I'd shoot battalion and division matches. I was what was called a PMI, a primary marksmanship instructor. And my coach said to me, he goes, Wes, you are so good with a weapon, I think that you could shoot the Olympics. But I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, when the war in Africa, when the war in Vietnam got over and I couldn't get over there, I decided I'm going to get out and go to Rhodesia and become a soldier of fortune. But you know, fortunately, folks, Christ would get a hold of my life and it would literally transform everything about me. I have a, I'm the oldest of four boys in my family and my sister is the youngest. There's five of us all together. I joined the Marine Corps. My brother, Rick, who was just under me, also joined the Marine Corps. He was an officer, also Special Forces. And uh, I remember that when my mother told me many years later after <clears throat> I'd become a believer, she said, you know, when you joined the military and you went away, your brother came to me many years later and he said, you know, Mom, when West left to join the Marine Corps, he goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He goes, he was the meanest man I have ever met in my life. He was extremely violent. He would fight, and he wouldn't just fight to beat people up. He would try to hurt them. He would try to injure them, and he was extremely cruel with his words. And folks, I don't know that it was, I was trying to be so much this way, but I grew up in some tough areas where I had to fight a lot, and I was trying to send a message to people, leave me alone. So when I beat someone, I would give them a very serious beating. And yet he said, but when he became a believer, he said, Mom, he changed so much. I did not want him to ever leave again. And he's actually a missionary on the field today too. I've got three brothers that are actually, uh, me and two of my other brothers, all missionaries in different parts of the world. But you know, this is one of the things that's supposed to happen to us. The gospel is supposed to transform us. We're not supposed to fit into this world. We're not supposed to be like this world. We are supposed to be a people that is absolutely changed. And I want to start out by reading you a portion of Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone there that would belong to the way where the men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his own on his uh, journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, their kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. 
Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, folks, many people believe this is when Paul the Apostle started his public ministry, but this is not what happened at all. For the next 13 years, Paul the Apostle pretty much disappears. We don't know much about what happened to him during this time of period of his life. Uh, we know for a time that he was in Arabia, but beyond that, the scripture is strangely quiet. There's almost no mention of what was going on in Paul's life at that time. But what was ever happening, God was putting tremendously deep roots into his life. When he would start his public ministry, he would only have 22 years of ministry. When he writes the second book of Corinthians, he's 11 years into his ministry. He's got another 11 years before he's going to be martyred for his faith. And he talks about the suffering that he went through in the first 11 years. And he says, five times I received from the Jews, 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, in danger from Jews, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone in without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides all these other things, I face daily my pressure and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. I think most people going to the mission field, if they were beaten once or twice, they might see it as a sign of suffering for the Lord. But by the third or fourth, I think they would be questioning their walk with the Lord. But this is not who Paul is. See, Paul has been truly transformed by the word of God. And he's a man that's been completely changed. See, you have to realize something about Paul. Before he became Paul, when he was Saul, he was a brilliant man. According to his own account in the scripture, in two different places, he says he was the chief Pharisee among all Pharisees. According to legalistic righteousness, there was no man in Israel that was more righteous than Paul. He was a man that lived according to what the law said. He was a brilliant man. He had a teacher by the name of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel said that the hardest thing that he had for Saul was finding enough books to get him to read. When you read the books that Paul authored in the Bible, you can see why God chose him. He was a very eloquent man in putting things together there. He was a brilliant man. And folks, I suspect that he had high aspirations in life. You know, when you're the smartest guy, you tend to think that you're supposed to lead. And I would not be surprised if Paul had his eyes on being the high priest someday. But whatever his aspirations were that day, whatever his dreams, whatever that he hoped to do, it all ended on the road to Damascus. And that one moment of life, everything changed for him. And that's exactly the way it is supposed to be for us. When we meet Christ on the road, we are completely to be changed. When Paul, Paul talked about receiving 40 lashes minus one, meaning 39 lashes, there was a good reason the Jews did this. They used a whip called the cat nine tails. It had a long rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather that hung down from it. Within the leather was pieces of uh, metal, pieces of shell, and pieces of bone. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of the body. Early historians say that it was an absolute massacre. And the reason they would give you 39 lashes is most men died at 40. Not all, but most. So they literally learned to beat a person within an inch of your life. And this is exactly what happened to Paul. See, and one of the things that we need to realize is that God really wants to be effective in reaching the world for Christ today. But so often the world looks at us and it doesn't see any different because we're trying so hard to behave like them. When we're never supposed to be this way, we are people that are supposed to be completely set aside for the gospel. I think about my own personal road to Damascus experience. And folks, it didn't come when I first got saved. I got born again in the Marine Corps and uh, the first six months I was in the Word just all the time, reading the Bible two, three, five, six, seven, even nine hours a day. But the first book that I read after that was a book called Tortured for Christ, written by Richard Wombrandt. Richard Wombrandt was a very famous Romanian pastor. He spent 14 years in prison for his faith, and he was ex tortured extensively for believing in Jesus Christ. I remember that when I got out of the Marine Corps, this book had had a profound effect on my life. And I heard that Richard Walmart was speaking in a very large church in Southern California. Now, it was not a Calvary Chapel, but it was an outstanding church. 
The pastor of that church is one of the foremost theologians in our generation today. And I remember that I went there to hear him because I wanted to hear this very famous pastor. When he walked into the room, he walked in wearing his socks. He had no shoes on. And the reason he did that was when he was in prison, they would often try to get him to deny his faith. And he would refuse to do it. So they would take him, they would lay him across the table, they would take his shoes and socks off, and they would take a board or uh, a two by four or a bat, and they would break all the bones in his feet. And they did this on multiple occasions. His feet were so damaged, it was very painful for him to walk in shoes. I actually went to see him in his house about a year and a half before he died, and still he just walked around everywhere in socks. When he went up on the stage, he talked about the most incredible stories of persecution I'd ever heard of. And I actually had a good friend who's a Calvary Chapel pastor that worked for Richard Wombrandt for a number of years. And he told me that one time they were going to a church and they got caught in a rainstorm. He said, when they got in the church, they were completely soaked. Fortunately, they had their luggage. He said, when Richard got in there, the pastor said, Richard Wombrandt, Reverend Wombrandt, quickly go into my office, change. You're gonna be on stage in five seconds or five minutes. He said, when he took his shirt off, he said, you could see all the cuts, all the bruising, where the skin never returned to the natural color. He said, but what I recognized the most is on the front of his stomach, down about the right-hand corner, there was a large black spot about the size of a half a dollar. And I looked at him and I said to him, Papa, what happened to you? He said, there was a time that they tried to get me to deny my faith, and I refused to do it. So they took an iron poker and they heated it in the fire until it turned orange. And then they pushed it all the way through my body in the hopes of getting me to deny my faith. But I completely refused to do it. When Reverend Wombrandt got done that day, folks, I said to myself, I am going to be the last person to leave this place. I need to understand this man's faith. But something would happen that day that would surprise me more than anything Reverend Wombrandt had said. Literally within 10 minutes, and this is a church of 15, maybe 20,000 people, the entire auditorium was empty. I watched all those thousands of people walk out. They said, thank you, we'll pray for you. Not one of them did pray for him. Not one of them gave him a gift for his ministry. And I said to myself, did these people not hear what I just heard? Did they not understand it or did they not perceive it? I know their pastor, he's an outstanding expositor of the word. How could they walk in here and hear this and just get up and leave? So I went up to Reverend Wombrandt and I said, well, Reverend Wombrandt, I don't know how to help, but I would at least like to help. I'd like to write a check. Who do I write the check to? And his wife, Sabina, said, Wes, write the check to Jesus. So I got out my checkbook and I wrote a check for $180. Now, folks, it doesn't seem like a lot of money, but at that time in my life, it was probably all the money that I had. And then Sabina began to talk to me and she said, you know, my husband spent many years in prison but I also spent many years in prison. She goes, it was a very dark time in the history of Romania. If you were considered a threat to the state, there was no court trial, some officer would write an order and they would take you out at midnight and they would shoot you in a firing squad. She said, we had a young girl in our cell that was about 17 years old and they had determined that she was a threat to the state and she was to be executed that night. She goes, within our cell there was a great gloom because she was a young, beautiful Christian girl. She was only 17 years of age. She said, but all of a sudden this young girl spoke up and she said, me and my fiance had hoped to glorify Christ in this life by being missionaries, but that is not how I shall glorify him tonight I will glorify him with my death. She said, because of the girl's faith, it was like a light came into the cell. It lifted the spirits of all the women. She said, when the soldiers came to get, get her, it was this radical scene because there's these two huge men. There's this tiny, petite little girl, and they're marching her off to shoot her, and they can hear this young girl talking to them, and she says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life and he who believes in him shall never die. And they shot that young girl that night. And guys, that would forever change my life. I would never ever be the same man again. I'm gonna come back to this in a minute, but I need to explain something to you here. When I went to Africa, folks, I did not go there to be a soldier. I went there to be a pastor, to be a Bible teacher, to be an evangelist. My wife, Vicki, was there to do the women and children's ministry. But then the war in Sudan got very severe. And rebel groups began coming down and attacking villages around us. 
One of the villages they hit was called Machwini, and they took 58 newborn babies and they crushed their heads against trees. They would come in and rape all of the young girls from the age of nine years old to as old as a woman could be. And then when they got done with them, often they would take them into sexual slavery. If they didn't take them into sexual slavery and they didn't kill them, which they killed a tremendous amount of them, often they would cut their lips off of them, their noses off of them, their ears off of them, their breasts off of them, their fingers off of them. They wanted to bring great terror to the people and they were extremely effective about doing it. And the Lord told me, you have got to begin protecting these women and children. <clears throat> so we began to build sanctuaries for the women and children to come in at night. When the sun would begin to set, at first you would just see a trickle of women and children coming in. But by the time the sun went down, they estimated 44,000 women and children a night were coming and looking for sanctuary. Under every tree, under every veranda, they were trying to escape the weather and the rebels. And among the South Sudan army, they are great warriors. They're extremely tenacious in battle, but often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win a battle. And then they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages that they pulled out of, we came into right after they did, me and my men. The Islamic army came down, they built these huge bonfires, and they picked up all the babies and the toddlers and they filmed them and burned them alive. And when we got there, we could see the remains of the children in the ash of the fire. And the Lord told me, you've got to do something about this. <clears throat> so I set the men down and I said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, it is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We're men, they're women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of a man. We are called to protect those that cannot protect themselves. We are called to care for those that cannot care for themselves. We know the tactic of the enemy. They don't hit hard targets. They don't come with 200 men and fight 200 men. They're cowards. They come with 200 men and they fight where there's five men. So if they come with 200 men one night and there's only five of us, just know this is the day you're gonna go home to meet the Lord. And you stand and you fight to the last man because in doing so, maybe another 10 or 20 women and children will escape. See folks, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that's truly terrified before, but probably the most vivid image in my mind was of a little girl. She was about two and a half years old. Her mother was killed in a rebel attack. <clears throat> when we found her, she was still holding onto the body of her dead mother. And I remember reaching down and picking this little thing up and putting her in my wife Vicky's lap. And every part of her body is trembling. Her arms, her chest, her stomach, her thighs, her calves, everything is shaking. What this little girl understands that many of us do not is that in southern Sudan and northern Uganda, <clears throat> monsters are real and they come to kill. And the heart that we have for these children is to be able to say to them, <clears throat> honey, you lay your head down tonight and you sleep and you dream the dreams that a child is supposed to dream. Nobody's gonna hurt you tonight, not on my watch. Tonight, the body of Christ is gonna wrap its arms around you and we're gonna protect those that cannot protect themselves. We're gonna care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. See folks, as believers, we're living in a generation today where we are raising a generation of effeminate men in America today. Men do not understand their role anymore. They don't even know how to behave anymore. I was getting on an airplane in Fort Lauderdale a few years ago, and I remember that this NFL star gets on the airplane. I mean, guys, he's so big, he looks like a gladiator. He's just huge. But I noticed that he had a Louis Vuitton bag over his shoulder, and I looked at the guy and said, wait a minute. I go, isn't that a purse? He goes, no, it's a bag. I said, well, my sister has the same one, and she calls it a purse, so I don't know what the difference is here, you know. <clears throat> But see, this is the generation we're living in. Men are so into fashion today. Why was that ever supposed to be important to us? Why were we ever supposed to care about that? See, as men, we have this God-given right to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. You know, guys, sometimes I feel like that in the ministry over there, I've had these revelations or what I might call an epiphany, a revelation from the Lord. One of the things that I've realized is that we don't always get to choose the battles we fight but the battles are chosen for us by God to fight. I did not go there to be a soldier. I went there to be a pastor. In February of last year, I was in my um, office and I was ordering three armored vehicles. And the reason I'm doing it, folks, is we used to be fighting one army, the radical Islamic army of, of 
uh, northern Sudan. We are now fighting five different armies, and there's 148 different rebel groups operating in the South Sudan. It's considered one of the five most dangerous places in the world to be. You cannot go anywhere unless you're fully armed. Just to send my men out into Bible studies, we put on full bottle armor, everybody grabs their machine guns. That's what we have to do to go teach a Bible study out there. And I was on my computer and I was trying to order these three armored vehicles and I was typing and I turned and I had a set of Hughes commentaries on my desk and my watch bumped it. And when it did, it set off a beacon in my watch. My watch is designed with a beacon that if I get shot and I cannot get up under my own strength, I can send a signal to my men to tell them to come and get me. And I just sat back in my chair and I said, Lord, this was never ever what I thought ministry was supposed to be like. I did not come here to fight and shoot and kill other men. I came here to reach people with the love of Christ. But I did not choose this battle, guys. It was chosen for me by God. When, when you read scripture and you're a soldier, I really think that you see scripture in a different light. And guys, when I read scripture, I, I think about King David. You know, when he wanted to build the temple of the Lord, God sent the prophet Nathan to him and he said, David, it's good that it's in your heart to do this, but you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. And guys, about... Three years ago, we had an enemy patrol of over a thousand men that were probing our village. And we knew they were out there, our scouts had spotted them, and we had to go out and watch for them every single night. So I had to deploy my men into the field about seven o'clock every night till about four o'clock every morning, and we were watching for them. And my standing order was intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let one single one of them escape. Now, if they re surrender, will we take them prisoners? Of course we will. But if they escape, we know that they will come back for the women and children again. And so in my own personal life, I think about that. You know, if I ever wanted to build a temple for the Lord, I suspect the Lord would send a prophet to me and say, Wes, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. And guys, the great thing is I can build God's church. I have been in a war now for 23 years. I've been in a war 17 years longer than the Second World War, which only lasted six years. And I am weary of the fighting that is over there. But see, I didn't choose this battle. The battle was chosen for me by Christ to fight. But I want to come back to this young girl. And guys, this is why this has affected me so much throughout the years of my life. See, I am a man of war, and I function extremely well in a war zone. I've heard generals of the South Sudan Army talk about me, and they'll say, this man is an extremely serious soldier. He knows exactly what he's doing in combat, and I do. But I think about this young girl. She's 17 years old. And guys, while I'm a soldier, I'm not unaware of how young women think about marriage. I remember as a child how young girls used to play wedding. They put little handkerchiefs on their head to pretend they were getting married. They dream about it their whole life. They anticipate the day, the gown, the ceremony the vows that they will exchange with their husband, the intimacy that they will share, the children that will be born, the life and the ministry they could have had together. And all it would have taken for that young girl to have that was to say, I deny Christ. But instead, she chose to die. That was almost over 60 years ago. But it would forever change my life. See, if I am a man who's trained for war and able to handle this, and this young girl could give so much more for Jesus Christ, how much more should my life count? And one of the things that I think that you need to understand as believers is we have to ask ourselves, have we ever given to the Lord where it's actually ever cost us anything? Have you ever financially given to your home church here where it's actually cost you? I mean, maybe you pay your tithe and you feel like you paid your taxes, but have you ever given where it's cost you? Have you ever done ministry where it was inconvenient or you didn't want to do it? You know, a lot of people volunteer for childcare because they have children there. And they kind of want to keep an eye on them. As soon as their kids are out, they're paroled, they go into something else. But have you ever done it when you didn't have any children in childcare? Have you ever shared your faith when you weren't sure if it was safe or not? See, as believers, we are to be defined by our relationship with the Lord. Pastor Don McCord came out with me this last summer and he said, Wes, he goes, in 50 years of ministry, I've never seen more fruit or more potential for fruit. He goes, but I notice that you do not interact with a lot of other ministries. I go, Don, I don't train my men to be sold out for Christ. I train them to be absolutely fanatical for Jesus Christ, to love Christ with such a passion that it supersedes all other things in their life. 
to love him and let it drive their life, to get them to where they wake up in the watches of the night and they walk around and they pray for those that are perishing without Christ. See, we are to be defined by Christ, not by the things of this world. And yet the reason we are losing the war for the gospel in this nation is we're trying too hard to fit in. I want to share with you folks about one of my chaplains in the last three weeks of his life. And guys, you're going to recognize him on a video in a moment. Uh, you'll recognize him because he's got a large gap between his two upper front teeth. His name is Peter Guy. I don't know why, but in southern Sudan and northern Uganda, if you have a large gap between your two upper front teeth, you're considered a very handsome man or a very good-looking woman. I don't know why. It's just a part of their culture over there. Beauty is extremely different in Africa, guys. If you're thin, they don't think you're very good-looking. If you're overweight, they think you're great-looking. I told my wife, Vicky, I said, you've got to be careful. I said, I'm like the Fabio over a village out here, you know. It's just very different. <clears throat> but guys, we had got news in May of 2014 that Peter had been killed at the front line. So we actually lost three guys that day. What happened was the enemy launched a massive offensive. They came down with 7,000 soldiers. His unit was the first one that was scrambled and sent into attack while other units were being put together. They had 700 men. They ran headlong into the enemy. They fought three battles. 300 men were killed. There were 400 men left. There was an ominous feeling among all the men that everybody was going to die. And that ominous feeling was correct. They all were going to die. The only reason we know what happened is we had a fourth chaplain there whose name was also Peter. And he was sent out about two days as a runner before the final battle. And he told me about the last three weeks of Peter's life. And he said, Wes, Peter was really suffering in the last days of his life. He said a month before he died, his wife left him for another man. And she said to him, I don't want to be married to a pastor. I don't want to be in the ministry. I want a better life. There is no better life, folks. It was just lust for another man. But it literally broke the heart and it broke the spirit of Peter. He said, yet the men in our unit did not know it. Peter would not tell them what was going on. I would watch him. He would take his Bible. He would go out. He would sit down with 20 men. He'd open up the Word of God. And 30 minutes later, all their heads would go down and he'd lead them to Christ. And then there'd be 10, and then 5, and then 15, and another 20. And when he was absolutely exhausted, he would come back and he would suffer in silence with us. But he would not tell people what he was going through. And he was, he was bewildered. He couldn't wrap it. He would say, I, I don't know, why she, I don't know what, what happened. I, I loved her. I don't know what I did wrong. A week before he was killed, his sister called him and said, Peter, your wife has left you. You need to leave the military. Come home and take care of your kids. And Peter responded, he said, first of all, I am a soldier within the South Sudanese army. If I were to leave, that is desertion, which is punishable by firing squad. He said, but far beyond that, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go. He goes, I was chosen by God to be here at this particular place and time, and I will not leave my post. We were in communication with them on radio just before the last battle. And the last transmission we got was, we see a large army arrayed against us. We will call you after this battle. The call never came, folks. All 400 men were killed. We have never recovered the body of Peter or other two chaplains. But I have often thought about when Peter crossed over to the other side, folks. See, he didn't just cross over by himself. He crossed over with 400 men that he led to Jesus Christ. Whatever the heartache, the betrayal, the suffering that he was feeling, he is a prince in the kingdom of God and his reward will be great. You know, folks, when you read the story of the 10 minas, it says God gives a mina to three different men. One bears 10, one bears five, one bears it in the ground. To the one that bears 10, he says, you're gonna be in charge of 10 cities. To the one who bears five, you're in charge of five cities. To the one that bears it in the ground, he says, take it away and give it to the one that has 10. They said, but sir, he already has 10. He says, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. And what this scripture is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for the kingdom of God. Now, it's strange to think that if we win 10 souls in this life, we might be in charge of 10 cities in the kingdom of God. I've actually done an extensive study on this scripture, and a lot of theologians believe that on the other side of eternity, we will actually be over cities in the kingdom. Much like the British, when they had their empire around the world with all of their colonies, 
like India or the Sudan, Kenya or Uganda, they would have a viceroy over the nation, will be viceroys over cities in the kingdom of God. Is Peter over 400 cities, folks? I don't know. But what I do know is the Bible says, the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, the mind cannot conceive the things that God has prepared for those that love him. We don't have the ability to understand what the treasures of heaven are like. The strange thing about the implication of the story is the man that says the man that has just taken away from one and give it to the one that has ten is that he's actually born again. He's actually in the kingdom. But there's no reward there. And it's strange to think about that, folks, that the treasures of heaven we cannot conceive are so great. You know, folks, you think there's a place that you hit bottom, that there's only a place that the enemy goes and it just can't get any worse. I found out over the years there is no truth in that whatsoever. The enemy seems to have a place that he can go down where he just keeps going down and down and down. We started to have rebel patrols coming into our area. And we had um, uh, rebels would come in and they would capture a family, sometimes a mother, a father, five, six, seven kids. And what they started to do was to take little girls or little boys of nine or 10 years of age and they would give them a machete and they would say, cut the head off your mother. And if the child refused to do it, they'd say, if you don't cut the head off your mother, we're going to cut the head off your mother, your father, your brothers, and your sisters, and then we're going to kill you. And little girls would have to kill their own mothers. I have counseled many of these children, and there's no ability in English to explain to you what that's like. We don't have words for it, folks. We've not experienced it. See, there's a great misunderstanding within the body of Christ. Often people say, well, what about the scripture that says, turn the other cheek? Well, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It never meant for them to let them murder our children, to rape our wives and daughters, to sell people into sexual slavery. That's not what it ever meant at all. It's meant we have a God-given right to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. We're going to show you a DVD here now, guys. And the first part is about the Syrian church. We're now operating in seven of the 10 most dangerous Islamic countries in the world today. We're in Afghanistan and Pakistan under Taliban. We're in Iraq and Syria under ISIS and Al-Qaeda. We're operating all over the world right now. And guys, we're putting, we, in the last couple of years, we've put about $3 million in the Middle East just to rescue believers, relocate them, support pastors, and feed the church. We're heavily involved in this part of the world. We have a division of our ministry, we call it ghost operations. It's the invisible hand into the closed world of radical Islam. And what we are doing there is we have over 700 pastors in the underground that we're supporting that are operating in all these radical Islamic things. The second part will tell you all the chaplains that have been killed. And guys, especially notice Peter Guy with the gap. Let's go ahead and show that. When the war started, many problems happened and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some, someday uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, at that time, I speak to the leaders and uh, we met together and I said, as in Acts book, the believers when they have the persecuted, most of them they go out of Jerusalem. If you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lost our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after a time, I turned back to see the decision of the leaders. I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave. We will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we built a graveyard 
this graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it first uh, happened in Raqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be, uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take it directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian. They put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, with his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they asked the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son in front of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between this uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, so, sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important things for, uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life and when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this. Father's arms 
on thee. The wounds this world left on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole. Sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face. And I will not be ashamed for my Savior knows my name. It don't matter where you bury me. I'll be home and I'll be free. It don't Folks, from 2000 to 2013, 13 of my men were killed in the war. In the last three years, 41 of our men have been killed in the service of Jesus Christ. And the war is going to continue on, and the fighting and the killing will go on for a long time. I think that many of us have some real misconceptions about what it means to have a life that is set aside for the gospel, that as believers that we're not to be attached to this world, that we are somewhat very much detached. We're sojourners. We're just passing through. I know that a lot of what I share with people is very hard for them to understand, but I have shared with the body of Christ that I have never had a problem having to take human life. Now, don't misunderstand me, folks. I don't like killing. I never have, and I never will. But when men come to rape women, to cut them up, to torture them, to sell them into sexual slavery, to murder children, and to burn them alive, we're going to do exactly what it takes to stop them, and we are not apologetic about it at all. Mm. As I said, people so misunderstand, turn the other cheek. I don't know why we don't get that. Why we can't understand it just means taking offense. But we have a God-given right to protect women and children. And as men, it should be in us to do this. As men, we are supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the family, the providers, the protectors. It's not supposed to be the wife that's the spiritual leader. And some of you guys are failing in your job, and you need to turn around and take what God gave you to do. You have a God-given right to do this. Folks, sometimes we don't understand what counting the cost means. I do a tremendous amount of reading of history. And I was reading about the Knight Templars. The Knight Templars lived a thousand years ago. Now, a lot of people said, Wes, are you supporting the Catholic Church? I said, well, first of all, a thousand years ago, the Catholic Church was the church. The church has always been the church, folks. There's always been true believers and false believers in every denomination. People that love Christ and people that do not love Christ, we have the phonies. But when you chose to become a Knight Templar, you chose a life of service. You were never allowed to marry. You were to be celibate the rest of your life. You wore the white robe with the red cross, the white shield with the red cross, and the job of a Templar was to protect Christians on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Back then, Arab raiders were taking them, killing them, robbing them, selling them into slavery again, sexual slavery for the women. And these men were there to protect. When Saladin was retaking over all of Israel and he was marching with his army, 140 knights found out that he was coming and they set out to intercept him and they intercepted him in Nazareth because there was a natural spring there. But Saladin was not alone. He was with 7,000 Saracen soldiers. And one day's march away was over 100,000 men that were following. Some of the knights wanted to turn and leave, but there was a knight by the name of Gerard. And Gerard said, listen, men, we have been sworn to protect. We have sworn to serve. And whether we live or we die, 
we will be with Christ. In 140 nights, attacked 7,000 Saracen soldiers. They were utterly destroyed. The last night to follow was a man by the name of James of Malise, and when all the other knights had been killed, he mounted his horse and he charged a 1,000 Saracens. The Saracens were so taken by his bravery, they begged him to surrender. They said, we will not harm you, we will not kill you, we will not enslave you, we will set you free. But see, James was born to protect, and so he fought until they slew him. What's interesting about this, folks, is this is not a part of Christian history. This is a part of Islamic history. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your heavenly Father. As men, we are called to live lives above reproach. You know, one of my staff members said to me one time, he said, Wes, I notice that young women always feel safe around you. I said, that's because I look at them from the neck up and not the neck down. I said, most Christian men, when they look at a woman, they'll give her the once over whether they realize it or not. And it tells them something about your character. See, we are not supposed to be like this. We're not to be lecherous men. We are to be holy. We are to be pure. And guys, so many people seem like they cannot live a victorious walk. But if you spend all your time playing video games and watching TV and watching movies and reading the things of this world, yes, you'll have a terrible time. I don't struggle with it. Why? I don't wash myself in that. I wash myself in Christ and his word. And I don't feel like it's a struggle to walk with Jesus Christ. I feel like it's an absolute joy and a privilege. In closing this morning, as you prepare to leave, I want you to understand something. You guys, much will be required of you. You know, you have a pastor that actually has a pastor's heart. And, uh, you know, I thought about being a pastor once many years ago, but I realized to be a pastor, you had to like people. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's not going to work. I'd better be a foreign missionary. And, uh, but you've been trained by a pastor who has a heart for the things of Christ. And the Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. You're one of the very few churches in this nation that has really been taught well. Your pastor has done a great job. As believers, we've been given this one precious life to serve Christ. If we throw that life away, we do not get a second chance. I don't know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will tell you what the greatest desire of my life is. And folks, in complete honesty, I do not think that I will live out my natural life. I think at some point, I will most likely be killed in the South Sudan. And when that time comes, I'm going to embrace it because a race has a beginning and a race has an end. And when your race is over, it's time to go home and be with the Lord. But when my time comes and I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and I look into his eyes for the first time, I want to hear him say, well done, son. Well done.